Things have been looking up for the New Orleans Saints during their 2023 training camp, but today things got a little bit better for the offense. We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Huda Nation and Huda family? Welcome in to another episode of Locked on Saints, your daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Saints, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much, as always, to all the everydayers out there making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget that you can always subscribe and follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss the daily episodes, and if you want to keep the conversation going one-on-one with me, as well as take part in our exclusive film studies, Q&As, and insider information, and much more, make sure you head over to joinsubtext.com slash locked on saints today. As always, I'm your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson Nola, on your favorite social media, your New Orleans Saints expert, credential member of the media. You can find me as a senior writer and reporter over at Saints News Network, Sports Illustrated's fan nation site, covering the New Orleans Saints every single Tuesday on the Locked on NFL podcast, and here with you every single Monday through Friday on Locked on Saints. Today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Head over to birddogs.com slash locked on NFL or use the promo code locked on NFL to get a free white tech hat. You've seen me wearing it out at training camp if you've been out there every day with any order. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you that. And I'll tell you more about them later. But on today's episode, we're going to take a look at two big visits for the New Orleans Saints. A couple of veterans, linebacker Anthony Barr, as well as running back Kareem Hunt coming in. Why they would be good additions for Fort New Orleans. We'll break that down. We're also going to take a look at play of the day and really the player of camp and Chris Olave, give you some updates on how the rest of the wide receiver group is doing with health again being a concern. But first, well, let's start off with a positive here. Derek Carr impressed in two minute drills and you should absolutely, absolutely care about this. for your New Orleans Saints because there have been a lot of things about the Saints that have been very exciting so far all throughout uh, training camp, whether it be the defense, whether it be Chris Olave, Marshawn Lattimore's start, all of that, Derek Carr's start himself. But today you got something a little bit specific that has real game implications from training camp. The New Orleans Saints went through a simulated two-minute drill, starting with a minute 40 on the clock And this was a two-minute drill at the end of the first half. So it wasn't like game on the line or anything like that. It seemed like the goal was to drive down the field and then get Blake Groupie, who, of course, is the undrafted free agent kicker out of Notre Dame, who's competing with incumbent kicker Will Lutz, an opportunity to kick a field goal kind of under pressure. And they did this a couple of times with Groupie. I'll tell you all about that here in a moment. But I want to focus on Derek Carr here because Derek Carr went 6 of seven going through those uh, that two minute drill, the only incompletion being when he spiked the ball to stop the clock. So otherwise, six of six to get them from their own 25 down to a 28 yard field goal attempt. Now, the reason why I highlight that it looked like the goal was to get the field goal unit out there and kind of have that kick in that simulated situation is because on what I believe was a second down for New Orleans, they chose to run the ball into the middle of the field, which moved with 22 seconds left on the clock, run the ball, get the ball into the middle of the field, line it up for that field goal. That's when they then spiked the ball on third down, kicked the ball in the field goal for fourth down. Usually if you're on a second down with 22 seconds left on the clock at the end of a two minute drill at the end of the first half and your clock is stopped, which theirs was at 22 seconds, you probably use second and third downs to take a couple of shots to the end zone before settling on the field goal on fourth down. So that's why I say that's one of the reasons why I think that the the goal was to get to that field goal at the end. But either way, this was really, really important for New Orleans to kind of see Derek Carr in this situation because 
Derek Carr is kind of the leader in the NFL when it comes to those two-minute drives, those game-winning drives, especially since 2014. He's number one in, in, in one of those categories. And so I, I think seeing this was big for me as an analyst trying to watch and kind of be critical about the team, try to kind of point out, okay, here's where they need to be better. This was something that they really needed to improve from last season. And so seeing Derek Carr be able to get the players in and out of the huddle, no confusion, no missteps, nothing like that, no miscues, everything was clear, relayed, everyone was on the same page. It was very clean, that drive. Compare that to last year, where the Saints had, according to pro football reference, in terms of how I could get this to to look at, or, or to, to kind of average out, I'm looking at all the drives that the Saints had in 2022 that started in a second or fourth quarter with two or fewer minutes left on the clock, two minutes or fewer left on the clock. So effectively looking at two minute drills in the second and fourth quarters, right? So there's 25 such drives for the New Orleans Saints last year. They scored, whether it be a field goal or a touchdown on only four of those drives in 2022. They also turned the ball over five times, according to pro football reference in those situations. So they had more turnovers than they had scores, combined field goals and touchdowns in 2022 on those two minute drives at either the end of the first half or end of the game, according to pro football reference. Of those four scores, only one was a touchdown, four score and not enough touchdowns ago, New Orleans. And so this is big for them to be able to kind of show that they have the propensity to be able to change that. The Saints scored on only uh, scored touchdowns on only 4% of those 25 drives. The average across the NFL was to score on 5.3%. So they were below average there. They were below average on field goals as well, scoring three field goals on 25. That's 12%. They ended up being below the 13.5% that you see across the NFL. And they were up in terms of turnovers at a whopping 20% of those drives ending in turnovers. To compare that to 2000 and, uh, 2018, so just to kind of look at the offense that we're used to, the Saints scored 12.5% or touchdowns on 12.5% of their drives, way up from where they were nearly three times better than they were last year, and turned the ball over only once on 24 such drives in 2018. So just to give you an idea of where they were last year versus where they have been at their best. So this is one of the reasons why you have to look at the two minute drive that you saw from Derek Carr today being a good sign for the New Orleans Saints and why you can't count them out going into 2023 the way that you were able to count them out in 2022. Let's face it, if the Saints were down more than a field goal, more than, if the Saints were down at all, getting the ball back with two minutes left, you didn't feel the same way that you felt in 2017, 2018, 2019 with Drew Brees having the ball in his hands like you might have felt about Andy Dalton having the ball in his hands in those situations. That's now set to kind of recorrect going into 2023. So I do think that that's an important thing to, uh, to keep an eye out on. Uh, I do want to mention that of the six passes, that Derek Carr completed during that two-minute drive, three of them were to tight end Juwan Johnson, who was spectacular throughout this uh, drive. He had a nice pass out to the sideline. He had another fantastic back shoulder catch uh, up the seam. Yes, the seam attack is back here in New Orleans. And you saw them also connect uh, on the right sideline with Juwan Johnson being able to get out of bounds. Juwan Johnson has been a clutch player for the New Orleans Saints. Look at last year's Atlanta Falcons game, the home game against Atlanta later on in the season for your evidence there. Now you're starting to see that here in these two minute drills. Juwan Johnson saying that he feels like he's playing with his big brother when he's out there with Derek Carr. And this drive, that two minute drive, absolutely showed that off in terms of their ability to be able to connect. So that's what we're looking at in terms of the two-minute drive, what that potentially means. Just for a quick note, the Saints' second team defense looked to force a three and out on their two-minute drive, but they kept rolling to be able to continue to get another opportunity there. Uh, James Winston was able to get them to a 47-yard field goal attempt, which was missed, but Derek Carr getting them to the 28-yard field goal attempt, that one was made. Coming up next, let's take a look at the play of the day and take a look at the rest of the wide receiver room and how they've been performing. But Chris Olave absolutely stole the show with what it might have been the best catch that we have seen all training camp. We'll get to that as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by our friends over at 
bird dogs. I'm wearing a pair of my bird dogs joggers today. I wore them out to camp because we were indoors all day today. Hallelujah. So I didn't have to be outside. So that was really nice. But it also meant I got to rock my bird dogs joggers, which are super, super comfortable and uh, some of the best that I've ever owned. So if you're somebody that likes the Lululemons of the world and things like that, bird dogs fit way better and are a lot more affordable as well. You get a lot more bang for your buck with these guys as well because you can basically create your own shorts, create your own, you know, they have everything for you. You like liners, you like eight inch inseams, you like six inch inseams. If you're with me in Club Hoochie Daddy, Bird Dogs is absolutely the place for you to go. So make sure you go and check them out today or whenever. And you can also head over to birddogs.com slash locked on NFL or use the promo code locked on NFL. That way you get that free white tech hat as well. It's a beautiful piece, little pink uh, bird dogs logo on the front. That's birddogs.com slash locked on NFL or promo code locked on NFL to get that free white tech hat. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you that. All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Thank you so much, as always, for being a Locked on Saints, your first listen of the day, every day to all you everydayers out there. And thank you to everybody who's joining us here for the live show, whether you're joining us live or you're joining us later. I see y'all. Thank you very, very much for being here with us, y'all. Next thing that I want to look at here is uh, Chris Olave, because Chris Olave stole the show, stopped the show. He was the showstopper. He was the record scratch for the New Orleans Saints uh, on uh, Monday's practice, especially in one-on-ones. Now, there's a couple of things to highlight here. Uh, Chris Olave went three of four in one-on-ones and then had one of those catches that makes you go, okay, he's him. Like, it was that moment. Um, Chris Olave has spent a lot of time over the course of this offseason working on contested catches, and you've seen it, mini camps, OTAs. This was really the, the one that lets you know he's arrived in a way. Um, and it wasn't against any, you know, third string corner, fourth string corner, training camp body type, anything like that. This was one up against uh Alante Taylor, who has been outstanding so far and has been outstanding for a while when it comes to the New Orleans Saints. And so the next thing that you look at is um, how is he making those plays? So Derek Carr lines up with Chris Olave and with Alante Taylor going up one-on-one against one another. uh, Chris Olave runs a route that gets him behind Alante Taylor into the end zone. The pass gets thrown up. They get a real opportunity to be able to go up there and make a play. And so what does he do? Well, he goes up. Alante Taylor goes up, but he kind of keeps his back turned to the ball. The ball is falling like it's about to hit Alante Taylor in the back. And Chris Olave literally reaches over his back and plucks the ball up from behind uh, his back and makes that catch and reels that in for what would have been a touchdown. It is the best play, perhaps, that we've seen all training camp so far. And it was absolutely outstanding. So this is just a testament to Chris Olave's work. This is a testament to Cody Burns' work. This is a testament to, um, it's really just a testament to Chris Olave. I I was gonna try to give some shine to Derek Carr here, but it was not about the throw. It it simply wasn't. And it's not that it was a bad throw. It's not that, but it also wasn't a throw that made you, oh man, the placement was really good. It was just like all Chris Olave being Chris Olave. And if you look at where Chris Olave has the ability to make the biggest impact, it's going to be in those situations. It's going to be in those, the offense just needs to rely on somebody that can go up there and make the play. It's not just about what can he do in terms of creating separation. It's not just about what he can do as a downfield passer. It's not just about what he could do in you know those speedy screen situations, things like that. It's going to be about like, can you be the go-to guy when called upon? Look, the Saints, I've, I've been just like, railing on the the idea that they have not been able to stay healthy. And, and today's practice didn't prove me or anybody to the contrary at all. And when you look at where the Saints are amongst the rest of their wide receiver room, you've got concerns about Michael Thomas, who's played only 10 games in the last three seasons. And you'd like to see that change, of course. Uh, but what if it doesn't? Uh, Rashid Jaheed dealing with a groin injury, according to our friends over at New Orleans Football, Nick Underhill, Brooke, Hirchhoff, Brooke Hirchhoffer, and uh, Mike Triplett. Uh, Rashid Jaheed's going to be out for a few weeks, quote unquote, expected to be ready for week one, but it's a groin injury. And we've watched across the NFL for years and years and years and years, groin injuries 
creating issues for players, being kind of reoccurring issues, things like that. So what if one of those receivers gets sidelined? What if both of those receivers get sidelined for a game, right? Or the rest of a game or something like that. You know, you never know. Um, you have to be able to see Chris Olave be him. He's got to be the guy. He might have to be the focus if the players around him at the position can't stay healthy, which would be unfortunate because you know how great Rashid Shahid is. You know how phenomenal Michael Thomas has been in the past. So you want to see everybody around him stay healthy, but just what if is what you have to be ready for. And so far what we've seen from Chris Olave is that he is ready to be that guy. He is ready to be that player and plays like this establish that further. Um, Rashid Shahid's not the only guy that's missed time. Uh, we've also seen Traquan Smith miss also with a groin injury. Um, Brian Edwards has struggled throughout camp. He had two drills or he had two snaps during one-on-ones today where the quarterback didn't even throw the ball. Didn't even throw the ball because Brian Edwards could not separate from the receiver or from the defender, excuse me, and literally just stopped running routes. Just gave up, not gave up, but just like the, the play went dead basically. And you rarely see that in one-on-ones. Like at least the, the receiver gets the opportunity to make a play over the defender. No, nothing. Two, two different plays where it just fell apart. James Washington has been impressive. He's had some nice moments. He had a really nice opportunity for a contested catch today that he unfortunately couldn't come down with, but he had a great one. Great one on, um, on, um, on Sunday. I don't know why it took me so long to think of a day of the week, but that's where we are. Um, so I think that like w- when you look at the rest of the receiver position, you know that Olave's got to be able to be the guy. I will say that the other receiver that really stood out today, particularly in one-on-ones that I really enjoyed watching, uh, was Shaq Davis. I thought Shaq Davis was really impressive. He had a nice diving contested catch right after the big contested win that uh, that Chris Olave had. I had a, uh, a star next to the Chris Olave contested catch. And then right after that, we had a diving contested catch by uh, Shaq Davis in, uh, with Isaac Yadam in coverage on a throw by Jameis Winston. Uh, had that one starred as well right after that because it was just a great catch. So we've seen Shaq Davis kind of pick up. We've seen him do a little bit more on special teams. We've seen him do a little bit more elsewhere beyond just be the big bodied receiver type and everything. So I do think that that, go- or that that works in his favor for sure. So um, watch out for Shaq Davis over the course of preseason. And, and he was the guy that I thought was going to be maybe the camp star. There's been no surpassing guys like Chris Olave and Marshawn Lattimore, but, but Shaq Davis has made his presence known and he has made sure that everybody knows, hey, I can make some of these plays too. And so I think that he's one of these guys that's had a pretty strong camp. I don't think that he's pushing for a roster spot just yet over guys like Trey Quan and Keith Kirkwood and all that, uh, but I do think that he's doing some good things. Um, to, um, to Brian Edwards' credit, he did have a win uh, against um, Paul Sinadibo. Really, really nice route that he won uh, over there. So I don't want to completely like, I don't want to dump on the guy or anything like that or dunk on the guy or anything like that. But like, you know, it's just odd to watch those plays just kind of fizzle out and, and kind of go away. So not, not as great a day for Brian Edwards again, but, um, you're starting to see some of these receivers out there. The big thing though, is how quickly can you get Rashid Shahi back out on the field? The expectation is that he'll be ready for week one, which is really all that matters, but you'd like to see this unit continuing to work together and building chemistry with their quarterback. So those are the guys that I would definitely be out on the, uh, on the watch for. Uh, and it's great to be able to mention Shaq Davis's name because he's somebody you've kind of been waiting to hear about. Lynn Bowden's had a nice camp so far. Kiki Cootie's had some really nice moments thus far. Kawan Baker's had uh, some good moments. Uh, I'm you know, just looking over at my list here and seeing like a bunch of offensive players circled in those one-on-ones. And Mike had a nice day today too. Um, in, uh, or he had one, he had a, a really good rep over Isaac Yadam and he had another really good rep against uh, Isaac Yadam again later on. So look, these guys are making plays. They're doing their thing, but Chris Olave is the guy that's the standout. And you just want to see the rest of the unit come in, sort of start to try to meet where Chris Olave, where he's at. You're not going to meet Chris Olave exactly where he's at. Cause he's in another stratosphere right now, but you want to see these guys get as close as they can as an entire unit. All right, coming up next, we're going to take a look at Anthony Barr, Kareem Hunt, why the New Orleans Saints should absolutely sign both of those players and get you caught up on the rest of the news and notes from today's practice, including some more injuries and some uh, some other updates. we got that coming up for you as we continue on and wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. 
Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And listen to how cool what they have going on right now is because football season is about to kick off and FanDuel is going to give you a chance to win all season long. Because right now, when you bet on a Super Bowl winner, okay, so let's say you pick the New Orleans Saints, the Philadelphia Eagles, the Kansas City Chiefs, Buffalo Bills, whoever, right? You pick one team to win the Super Bowl. All throughout the year, you can get bonus bets every single time that that team wins. You can then take that bonus, those, those bonus bets and use them for things like spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. Just pick one team to win the Super Bowl and you'll get bonus bets every time that team wins throughout the regular season. It's a really cool opportunity to build up some of those bonus bets and get in on some more action around FanDuel as well. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on today to start earning those bonus bets with America's number one sportsbook. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Go and check them out today. Let's get it. Who that nation wrap it up today's episode of Locked on Saints. Appreciate you everybody for being here making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day. Sometimes your second listen, sometimes your third listen of the day. I really do appreciate it because we have been out here and grinding all training camp long and it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. So I appreciate everybody for being here with us. Let's take a look now as we wrap up today's show with some of the news and notes from around training camp day 11 uh, starting with visits for the New Orleans Saints. Just this morning, I cut an episode saying I am shocked, surprised, appalled, not really appalled, but you know, shocked, surprised, that the Saints hadn't brought in a veteran linebacker. First of all, they've done this year after year after year. They brought in James Laurinaitis. They brought in Nigel Bradham. They brought in all these guys that they love to bring in, these veteran running back, or excuse me, these veteran linebackers, and they hadn't done it yet this season. And that linebacker room behind Mario Davis and Pete Werner was already questionable coming into training camp. Then you lost Andrew Dowell. Now you've got Demario Davis, who's missing practices with uh, his injury, a calf injury that he had to get imaging done on. Now, if I'm the Saints, I'm in no rush to bring Demario Davis back to the practice field. It's, it's not like I got to get him ready for preseason games. You know what I'm saying? Like he's on the roster. He ain't got to prove nothing. He's Demario Davis. He's had over a hundred tackles every single season since he joined the New Orleans Saints. He's rejuvenated the entire idea of defense in New Orleans. I ain't that worried about Demario Davis, except I'm terrified about Demario Davis being hurt. So that would lead me if I were a general manager or a coach or anything like that to just say, Hey, Demario, take it easy, bro. We're good. We're good. We already know who you is. We already know what you're up to. You ain't got nothing to worry about. Take a seat. Take a seat. You'll be all right because we don't need you in the preseason. We'll see you week one. Um, and so that's just kind of the way that I go. I go with like as cautious as you can around a guy like Demario Davis, much like what I think the Saints are doing with Rashid Shahid. Um, so I think signing a guy like Anthony Barr makes sense because it gives you another guy that you can utilize in training camp. He's a veteran. I do think that Mickey Loomis during his pre-training camp presser mentioned that there were a couple of positions where they would love to get some veteran experience, some NFL experience in terms of depth. And I think linebacker was one of those positions. I also think the defensive line was another one of those positions. And so getting a guy like Anthony Barr would make a ton of sense. And the thing that I like about Anthony Barr is that he's a good player, all around player at that position, right? So you can see him being a guy that helps you in terms of uh, your pass rush that helps you a little bit in terms of coverage that helps you in terms of tackling run defense all those things but the thing that I really like about him the most is that maybe he gives you a lot of experience but also gives you that Caden Ellis like role of somebody that you can deploy as a third linebacker slash second linebacker in certain situations and be able to get after the quarterback and generate pressure for the second level and do all those things so I do think that he gives you somebody that can do that does he have the youth and speed of a guy like Caden Ellis no probably not at this point in his career I believe he's over 30 years old at this point and so I don't know that he gives you a perfect um you know, a, a perfect player that comes in and does it. Yeah, he's 31 years old, um, all told, at the moment, as the season begins. And so, I don't think he gives you the perfect player, but I do think that he gives you enough to be able to contribute for a bunch of ways. Um, the other thing that I look at is uh, the Kareem Hunt idea. Kareem Hunt brings versatility to a team that's going to be without Alvin Kamara for the first three games of the season, has already lost Eno Benjamin, who was kind of going to be the guy to maintain the Alvin Kamara playbook. Now he's done for the year with a ruptured Achilles. And today during practice, Kirk Merritt left practice early 
with a hamstring injury. So now we're seeing another soft tissue injury and we're seeing another player that we'll see how long they're going to be out or how long they're going to be missing or whatever it might be. And so I think that I look at Kareem Hunt as somebody that maybe doesn't necessarily fit the Saints criteria in terms of like their past but definitely fits the criteria on the field of what it is that the Saints are looking for. So the update that we do have so far on Kareem Hunt came from NFL Network and uh, Ian Rappaport, who mentioned that Kareem Hunt was visiting tonight, and that visit tonight being something a little bit like to where it's going to kind of go into the morning and all that. He's not expected to sign for a vet minimum contract. He wants money, but he's also a running back. So we'll see how that goes, uh, you know, for the Saints or for any team that might end up signing him. So I wouldn't expect to hear anything this evening, but maybe you hear something tomorrow. So in tomorrow's episode, we might be able to deliver an update on that. But it makes sense why the Saints would go out and grab him because he would be a guy that could come in and maintain that Alvin Kamara playbook for you. He can be impactful in the red zone. He can be impactful as a rusher on the outside and on the inside. And of course, can catch passes for you. He was one of the best in the NFL at his peak doing that. And he's a little bit younger. He, I don't believe that he's yet 30 years old. Uh, let me double check that real quick. But, you know, he's somebody that, yeah, 28 years old, um, just turned 28 actually yesterday. Happy birthday, Kareem Hunt. Um, he's somebody that can bring you that versatility that would allow you to maintain the Alvin Kamara playbook, which is kind of their first priority when it comes to those first three games of the season. So we'll see where it goes, but those are would be solid signings for New Orleans from the on-field perspective. All right, a couple of other um, notes for you today. The offensive line, I mentioned in, in this morning's episode that I would try to pay attention to not just, hey, Derek Carr delivered a great pass to this player, but to also credit the offensive line for making things like that happen. Uh, the offensive line starters looked pretty good today. Now, they had a couple of moments where Carr Granison beat Trevor Pinning. Uh, Brian Brzee put a big-time pass rush move on, um, on, on Cesar Ruiz, bulldozed him right up the middle. But those are just big standout plays. Consistently, though, the Saints had what I believe could be their starting lineup week one on the offensive line. Trevor Penning at left tackle, James Hurst at left guard, followed going from center out to right tackle, of course, with Eric McCoy, Cesar Ruiz, and Ryan Ramchek. And while they were out there, the Saints' offense was was cooking. Uh, Before the two-minute drill, a simulated two-minute drill, Derek Carr goes five of six during a third down period, during a red zone period and all that. So I think that you saw a lot of the good things that you wanted to see from the offensive line kind of tick down as some of the younger guys got out there, but that's okay. Growing pains. Um, Landon Young struggled a little, not struggled, but had, you know, lost a couple of reps, won a couple of reps. It goes back and forth. Uh, But I do think that the starting offensive line in particular performed extremely well. Lonnie Johnson Jr. had a great interception today. Jameis Winston targeting over the middle of the field to Lynn Bowden Jr. uh, And Lonnie Johnson and just a fantastic read on the ball. Uh, the pass maybe could have been delivered a little bit earlier. Lynn Bowden Jr. maybe could have worked a little bit harder to, to the to back to the football, but he was trying to catch it at the goal line. This is during red zone drills, so you don't want to give up the, uh, and I, I believe they were working third down red zone too, so you don't want to like come up a yard short. And so he didn't attack the ball the way that you might on a second down or a first down, and Lonnie Johnson Jr. made him pay. Uh, just came in, picked it off on the goal line, and had a great play. So uh, safety's looking really good for the New Orleans Saints. Ugo Amadi's continuing to play extremely well. Lonnie Johnson Jr. is playing extremely well. Jordan Howden and Smoke Monday both moving up. Smoke Monday could have had two interceptions today, uh, just didn't really work himself in position, one of which hit his hands. The other one, if he would have crashed underneath and trusted the, the help he had over the top, maybe could have picked it off during the two-minute drills, things like that. So you want to see a little bit of that from you know him sort of picking it back up. But remember, this is still kind of his rookie year, but still like what you're seeing from that safety position even behind Marcus May and Tyron Matthew. And then finally, um, you know, the last thing that I'll mention here, uh, well, actually, the, the last note that I had written here was about Brian Edwards and kind of his struggles today, but we kind of, we already covered that when we were talking one-on-ones. So um, yeah, no, I think that it was a, a solid practice for the New Orleans Saints, but the biggest takeaway is expect this team to be ready for those two-minute drives, whether it be at the end of the second, into the first half or at the end of the game uh, and putting themselves in position to be able to win games. That's one of the reasons why they went out and they got Derek Carr in the first place. So good to see it translating already in those simulated drives during the game. All right, y'all, I appreciate you as always, 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 always for uh, making us a part of your day, part of your routine, all that, making us your first listen of the day every day. Coming up tomorrow morning, we'll get you ready with some more. It's a day off for the New Orleans Saints tomorrow morning, so we'll just have the morning show. We won't have the live afternoon show uh, unless I record the morning show before a signing potentially happens for Kareem Hunt and Anthony Barr. If that happens, then we'll get a bonus show in, but then really dive into it on Tuesday. But coming up on tomorrow morning, 
morning's episode, we're going to revisit like we did the last day off, this time taking a look at who are the New Orleans Saints that you still want to see a little bit more from, especially with the preseason game right around the corner. So we got that coming up for you. Thanks as always, y'all, for making Locked on Saints a part of your day, part of your routine for saying yes to me and the show. As always, please, if you see me, say hi. And if you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints in between these episodes, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're mom and them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.